everybody. This is Houseways and Means, and we're meeting on April 22nd. Uh, welcome to um, our meeting. And um, we are going to, unless anyone on the committee has an announcement they want to make before we start, um, I don't see any. We're going to um, talk about two bills this morning. Um, that will be up for action on the House floor. And one of them is S340, which has to do with interfund borrowing. It's a subject we talked about a week or so ago. And the other is S341, which is a bill that um, allows the tax department to share information with Department of Labor um, to support the PUA, which is the Pandemic Un Unemployment Assistance Program. Um, and that's not a bill that we've looked at before. Neither of these bills are gonna come into our committee as far as I know. So we don't have to take formal positions and we're not being asked to report on the floor. Um, but just in case uh, somebody decided they should be in the committee or somebody wanted to know what we think about them um, and partly for the exercise so that we know we can do it. Um, I thought we would hear about both bills and um, take an informal position with a straw vote. Um, and I will do that however the committee wants me to. We can do it with a roll call or we can do it with a show of blue hands, um, whatever, whatever, whichever works. Um, and so that will be the first half hour. And then at 1030, we're going to shift gears. We're going to hear from Beth Pierce and from Chris Delia on the concept of having the state subsidize the interest rate for short-term borrowing on the part of municipalities, something that we talked about before. We don't have a proposal to do it, but um, I knew there were questions that, um, that Beth um, that the treasurer and the bankers could probably help us with to make us decide if that's a uh, direction that we want to go. So, um, and then I've got three or four things at the end of the morning that I want to go over. Um, so with that, uh, Damien. Good morning. How's everybody? Um, so the bill S341, uh, which is in front of you, it amends um, 32 VSA 3102E, uh, um, which as I'm sure everyone remembers is the discretionary um, uh, provisions there for the commissioner of taxes to release limited uh, tax return and return information. Um, and currently, if we could scroll down just a little further so we can see number eight, Sorsha. Um, Perfect. So currently, uh, the commissioner is allowed to re release limited information to the commissioner of labor for purposes of establishing the identity and liability of employers for unemployment compensation um, uh, uh, payments there. So um, contributions based on their experience. Uh, so typically with uh, employees right now for unemployment, we have wage records for them because the employers have been file, filing quarterly wage records. And this is used as uh, sort of an auditing tool. Um, so when an employee puts down that they were employed by someone um, during their sort of base period for unemployment and it doesn't show up on the wage records, this allows the commissioner of labor to go in and determine if they were receiving wages or income as an independent contractor and so forth. Uh, the pandemic unemployment assistance that Representative Ansel mentioned is like unemployment insurance, but it's not for employees, it's for self-employed and independent contractors or people who have had too little contact with uh, employment in the last uh, year and a quarter to qualify for unemployment insurance. Um, so it could be that uh, they were self-employed. It could be that they were just starting a job after taking a year off uh, to have a, a baby or something like that, but they don't have enough wages in there. So normally they wouldn't qualify for unemployment insurance. So what this does is it provides a benefit that's fully federally funded um, and is the equivalent to unemployment insurance, but for folks who have self-employment income. Uh, or no wage income anyway, or insufficient wage income. And so what this allows them to do is when folks apply for that, they say, this is what I earned last year. 
it's the 2019 tax year that we're looking at for purposes of determining that benefit. Uh, and this allows the Department of Labor to contact the Department of Taxes to say, is that accurate? And then the Department of Taxes will send back basically the line item information um, for the specific types of income that are considered for unemployment assistance. Um, and so this is just providing them with that limited uh, allowance to provide information to verify the earnings of individuals um, to determine Damien. benefit amounts. Uh, Robin has a question. Okay. Um, thanks. Quick question, Damien. Um, when we talk about income, are we talking about Vermont income or federal income? Because they can be different. We are talking about self-employment income. Right. Um, and when the commissioner of taxes may or may not be on, um, when he testified before, he mentioned a variety of self-employment schedules that you might be filing under, um, which are then uh, brought over to your Vermont income tax return um, for purposes of determining your adjusted gross income and so forth. So, um, so I'm not I'm not a tax person, unfortunately, but we're basically looking at your self-employment income line items from your tax return. Federal um, tax return? Uh, or yeah, Vermont? Federal and state tax return information. Again, I'm, I'm okay. not the person to tell um, you which yeah. line item That's right. or form they're on. Okay. Um, but my understanding is, for example, Schedule C, that yeah. information could be made available here um, from your 2019 tax return. Um, uh, but yeah, so thank you. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I need. Thank you. Great. Um, and for a committee, if we, uh, if you want to hear from Craig Bolio about how this is actually going to work, I think that's fine. It's not, and I can set that up. I, I don't think I have him coming in today. Is that right, Rob uh, Sorsha? Um, but the uh, question in front of, in the bill is tax return information going to be shared with the Department of Labor. So the 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 what of it um, matters to us, but probably doesn't matter for the purpose of the bill. Um, so, but yeah, let, and it's let me know if you want me to get Craig in here or, or Doug Farnham. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, I sh I should just note it's it's important to note that this is not a sharing of the full income tax return for someone who applies for this. It's just the necessary line items to determine that income eligibility. Well, um, on the UI website, it says you have to file your tax return. So the tax department may not be sharing it, but the, the applicant is um, uh, strongly is, is told to do that. And if they can't, if they haven't filed, they are told to self-attest. Okay, um, and I, it also, if you don't have a tax return from last year, so for example, uh, that instance of the individual I was talking about who say took a year off to have a child uh, and now is returned to the workforce only to find that uh, they were unemployed almost immediately or couldn't start their job, um, the way it works for them is if you don't have income, you get uh, a minimum benefit a plus the federal amount. benefit. Right. So. Right. So there is an opportunity to self-attest if you haven't filed yet because they've extended the tax filing date. A lot of people haven't, um, or some people anyway haven't, but, um, but it's, it's the, the way the, the system is set up, you're expected to give the department your tax return. Yeah. So, uh, Peter and Emily. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I, I'm glad Robin's ahead of me. I uh, also heard and saw, as Janet has said, that the uh, DOL is expecting you to submit your whole return. I, uh, I'm uneasy with that. I really think it ought to be limited to Schedule C um, because as a married filer, I get all cut. my wife's got income, I've got income. Anyway, I, I, I'm uneasy with that. I'm uneasy. And if this is session law, I understand it will have a self expiration but I'm also uneasy that there appears to be no going back, so to say. Thanks. Uh, Emily. Hi, Damien. Hi. Uh, does the Department of Labor need 
permission to also share this information beyond this afterwards for say auditing purposes or to evaluate the program or is it enough that it's just shared with the Department of Labor? Uh, I think it's um, it's enough that it's shared with the Department of Labor. It's important to note that the Department of Labor is subject to the same confidentiality requirements as the tax department. So once they get this information, they can't share it, although they internally can go back and, and audit. And also the unemployment programs are subject to extremely strict confidentiality requirements. So the data stays internal. Um, it's not shared with the broader world. Um, so you're looking at a very limited universe of people who have access to this. It's basically uh, the unemployment um, processing and the tax department, and they're all subject to extremely strict confidentiality requirements. And this information would be um, subject to the exact same requirements as the regular unemployment? Uh, that's my understanding is it's subject to the same confidentiality requirements. Um, there are, there is crosstalk between benefits programs um, where they uh, share information for purposes of verifying income and eligibility for benefits, but the information doesn't go outside of those very limited circumstances that have been authorized or required by federal law. And so they're allowed to do that crosstalk under this program too, without any additional action? Uh, it, it's a good question. My understanding is it's, it's the same as regular unemployment insurance, assuming these people then applied for say SNAP benefits or something like that. Um, there could be um, information sharing in that case. And that's my understanding is that's required pursuant to federal law. So once you've gotten into one system, the other systems can ask that system basically to say, um, is this in income information valid? Um, or did you, for example, provide unemployment benefits that should be considered as part of their adjusted gross income? So. Um, so there's a, a second section of the bill. I think I understand what it does, but maybe you could talk about it as well. Sure, so the second section of the bill um, is a repealer. Um, so this goes in and repeals all of this language. Um, and then the repealer effective date is um, uh, January 15th of next year. So um, the, it basically is just taking all of this language and taking it off the books. The pandemic unemployment assistance has only been authorized through December 31st at this point. On the off chance that that is extended, I set the repealer for just after the session starts so that we could go in and, and change the date. Um, you'll notice with the effective dates that there's a retroactive effective date to the date the federal bill passed. Um, I don't know that that's actually necessary, um, but the Senate committee was very concerned about um, the potential issue of, of uh, whether there's discussions between labor and tax before the governor signs the bill and asked for effective on passage with retroactive application. My understanding is that they're not ready yet to exchange that information anyway. And they're trying to process the applications and then go back and check to make sure the income is accurate and just adjust later. Um, so I don't know that this is necessary, but the, the Senate wanted to add it because they were concerned if there are any, there's any talk uh, right around that, that borderline there. And I just picked March 27th as kind of the earliest date that um, you might want to be retroactive to, so. Um, so committee, uh, Doug uh, Sorsha has magically uh, produced Doug Farnham. <laughs> so um, if we, uh, when we're finished hearing from Damien, uh, Doug is here to answer tax questions. Um, I'm amazed how, how 
uh, magic she is. We, ju we just wish to, for somebody to come and they show up. Um, Sam has a question. Uh, Damien, I'm not sure if this is a question for you, but is the formula to determine what somebody will get in pandemic unemployment insurance just what you would have earned in a regular week? Or your Schedule C divided by 52 or something like that? Yeah, so the formula is um, your self-employment income from 2019. Uh, then divided by 52 to get to a weekly average. And then about 57% of that up to a maximum of 513. Um, and the minimum I believe is like 130 or 190. Um, and it's basically one half of the weekly unemployment benefit uh, or the average weekly unemployment benefit. So um, if you earn too little, you just get that minimum floor um, and then you can earn up to $513 in state benefits. There's a $600 federal enhanced benefit through the end of July um, that was in the, the um, CARES Act stimulus bill. Um, so that, that's an additional federal benefit. So you could get up to 1113 a week, um, but your base benefit is again determined, take your 2019 self-employment income, divide by 52, then uh, take 57% of that. And that's your base benefit. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. And you could get a full 600 on top of that till July? You, you, so the way the federal enhanced benefit works is it applies to both unemployment insurance and unemployment assistance. With unemployment insurance, uh, if you're earning even just $1, you get the $600 federal enhanced benefit on top of it. Uh -huh. um, with the unemployment assistance, if even if you're earning the state minimum, which is like I said, uh, I think it's 130 or 190 something. Okay. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. You get that plus the $600. And that's, um, it's $600 flat, doesn't matter what your, your base benefit is. Um, and okay. that, that's a federal enhanced benefit to try to pump money into the economy. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Yep. Okay, I mean, um, these uh, benefits date back to uh, what they... I'm sorry, I, I missed that. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, um, although the program isn't up, um, aren't people able to apply backdated yeah, I believe they're able to backdate benefits to March 15th. Um, but yeah, basically the, the way that works from the Department of Labor um, perspective is that you'll apply for each of those weeks and they can send you uh, a lump sum check to bring you up to date and then, um, <clears throat> and then just pay you your weekly benefit going forward after that. Okay, um, so committee, we have Doug Farnham here. Do you, do, um, do you wanna, uh, we had some tax questions. Do you wanna ask Doug about those? Okay. Hi Doug, Robin, you go ahead. I'm not sure. Thank you. And hi, Doug, thanks for magically appearing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll ask the question I was asking poor Damien to answer and he's not in the tax department. Um, the, the information that the Department of Labor is gonna need from self-employed and independent contractors, is it from the Vermont tax return or the federal tax return because they're different and this you know, business income and loss seems to show up on the federal but gets mixed in if you're filing jointly on the Vermont so how is that going to work right so the 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 data is primarily going to be from the federal return which is attached to the Vermont return because okay when we're querying it in the department that's generally what we have to do okay um we consider that Vermont tax return so it's not federal tax information um and our logic there which has been vetted by the IRS is that because it is attached to a Vermont state tax return, it's a requirement of the Vermont tax return. It's Vermont tax data, not federal tax information. In the file that the Fed send us a year later, 
where they've audited it and it's federal tax information, um, that is not what we would share. We don't move FTI around unless we have to. So we would be sharing the version of the return that is attached to the, the initial filing that comes to Vermont. And generally that's through modernized e-file. Um, and that would be in our in our tables if it's in, through modernized e-file. If it's a paper return, there's a little bit more work for the department to verify that. Right. Um, but over 80% of the returns are in our tables at this point. Okay. Um, and then some of the information would be from what we think of as the Vermont tax return, the IN 111. Mm -hmm. and, but mostly for demographics purposes, mostly you know, just lining up the social security number, the name, the address, those type of demographics. And to speak to some of the, the concerns about sharing and scope, um, for the existing data sharing we have with the Department of Financial Regulation, the Department of Labor, the department will not share any more than is absolutely necessary to complete the task that is being performed. Um, so those confidentiality carve outs that exist, uh, you don't get to ask for every field on the IN 111. We push back immediately and we say, what are you using this for? What exactly, why exactly do you need all these fields? Mm -hmm. So we do limit it on our end. Um, and uh, I think uh, the committee can attest that, that sometimes our protectiveness can be frustrating. Um, that we, we, we err on the side of caution is yeah. what I'm trying to say. Okay. Oh, one of those. Oh, go ahead, Robin. Sorry, right, this is a follow up. Um, uh, Damien said that if, if people are supposed to file their 2019 before they apply for the self employed people before they apply. Um, and if they haven't filed it yet, they can self attest at the Department of Labor. But let's say somebody has filed, how long electronically filed, how long does it take before you have that information and that it would be shareable with the Department of Labor. So when somebody goes in and they filed two days ago, is it available or is it a week or how does that work? Uh, we do receive modernized e-file. If they file electronically, then mm -hmm. it would be, um, we receive those files, I believe overnight. So, mm -hmm. and then those are loaded into our system the next day. Uh, mm -hmm. A couple of days from when they file, it might be hitting our system. Okay. It might have some work list edits and we are working through our returns right now. Yeah. Um, and we're actually maintaining a really positive percentage of, you know, of keeping on top of our work list. We just have fewer returns coming in. So um, we're tending to deal with the, the more issues. If they file paper, um, that is challenging because yeah. um, we received much a much smaller amount of paper returns this year, but still even smaller for us is thousands of paper returns. Mm -hmm. So if it's in one of those batches and it hasn't been scanned into the system, there's no reasonable way for us to find someone's return right. in a stack of documents. Uh, we don't go through and index them as they come in. That would add an insane amount of um, overhead mm -hmm. to our process. Right. So if they file paper, that's generally going to take two or three weeks um, before it gets in the system and we can see it, depending on the time of year and the mail flow on those particular days. Um, but I, I think two or three weeks is generally uh, the delay we see from someone filing a paper return. Okay. Great, thank you. So I'm just gonna, um, I'm, I'm gonna support this. Um, we're not, we don't formally have the bill anyway, but I do have a concern about a, a state agency that basically conditions benefits on, uh, on having a taxpayer provide their tax return because that's basically the way the program is set up. I realize we're in unusual times and so on. And I appreciate all the caution that your department has, but basically labor is saying, you get this benefit if you give us your tax return. And um, if you don't have your tax return and you can't uh, self attest to your, um, your income, you're gonna get just the base amount. And so I, I just lodged that as a concern. It, I, I think tax is doing what they're doing properly. And I get that we're in a weird world, um, but it doesn't make me really comfortable. Uh, Jim, Peter, and Emily. Yeah, Doug, I think you were pretty clear, but when, when, the, le when the legislation says uses the word access. Um, if I want, if I'm a laborer and I want certain information and I want to access it, it's really up to you to decide what gets released. And you work through whatever process you do to determine that, which gives, I mean, I agree with Janet, but I think 
how you've described the word access is um, important. Right. I think it's it's we don't give anyone actual full access, even if even if the wording uh, kind of could be read that way. Yeah, I don't um, think it's in there. Yeah. Word access. So yeah. Uh, Peter and Emily, and then we're going to move on because we have another another bill that we need to deal with as well. I strongly agree with Janet. I uh, I understand. Uh, and for the purposes of Craig's uh, some position in this, it's my uh, feeling that unless the document asked for is directly supportive, reflective of self-employment, it should not be released. And so I, I don't know how to get at the DOL for asking for your whole return. Uh, that, that, that really flummoxed me. Uh, I think it really focuses on Schedule C and that's it. Just to, um, just to um, weigh in on that, I mean, the, the folks you may want to let know about that are either uh, Interim Commissioner Harrington yeah. or Director Cameron Wood, uh, who's the unemployment director. Um, but it, I was not aware until this morning that their, their information site says you're going to need to submit your um, you know, your, your tax documents, plural, um, there. So I'm, I'm not sure if they actually mean to take the whole return, they may not. like that says, yeah. or yeah. if they're planning to ask for some sort of limited piece. Yeah. But I, I do think that those would be the people to clarify that or to voice concerns yeah. with. Yeah, I think that, that I, this legislation doesn't allow them to do that or, or tell them that they can't. Um, yeah, this, this doesn't address their end at all. To do with it. Yep. Emily. Doug, are you aware if this is any different for how um, benefits eligibility works for um, when people submit tax information for food stamps or long-term care or any of the Agency of Human Services eligibility programs? Um, so it is different. Um, we're actually a little bit hamstrung with those programs because we don't have a sharing agreement with AHS. So um, AHS does receive its own federal tax information that it can use for verification. Uh, but sometimes there's a timeliness issue there because proper federal tax information has a year long lag in it. But when AHS um, like calls our tax fair services division and says, hey, we got a tax return uh, for this person, uh, is this right? We're actually, we cannot say whether or not that is actually their tax return or not. So um, we, we can't share with those particular programs, unfortunately. Thank you. And your understanding is that they request full tax returns as well for those programs? I was going to mention that, uh, yes. Uh, my experience has been that when another agency wants to get at even one particular piece of information that's buried in the tax return, um, they generally ask for the entire tax return because trying to explain to, to people, oh, we need this line from this schedule is much more work and much more, much more challenging to get people to understand just to pull out this one page buried in the federal return than it is to just ask for the entire return. Um, and they also do need to make sure that, um, you know, the, the, that information flows into the federal return properly, that they didn't just mock up that one schedule. Um, and I think that uh, to speak to the chair's concern earlier about taking a, a return that may or may not have been submitted, I can see why you would be a little bit concerned there because you can prepare a return and it could look like it had been submitted, but you have no evidence that that return was actually submitted. Thank you. Uh, Peter, were you jumping back in or did you just not lower your hand? Your hand's still raised, so we'll lower it. There you go. Um, great. I think um, I think we're good. Uh, any other comments that um, I'm looking around here? Oh, there you are, Doug. <laughs> I lost you. My screen all shifted around. Um, any other thing that you want to add to uh, the conversation? Um, I would just say that the department will it's been supportive of this this provision and would approach it with especially caution um to speak to peter's concerns we we would not share any more than is necessary um to expedite the approval of these claims it'd be similar to what we're already doing with the um 
uh, verification for the employers for unemployment insurance, we would only share exactly what is necessary for that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so committee, are people ready to, again, we don't have the bill formally, probably we should have, but it doesn't matter. Um, are people ready to take a position on the bill? Uh, does anybody want to move that we support it? Um, and this is not voting it out. This is just the motion to support it. I'll move that we support the bill. All right. Uh, that was formal. I like it. <laughs> I'll, 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 that? I'll second. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Um, so I'm. Um, we've got a bunch of people on my screen who are not members of the committee, and given that the little hand raising thing is going to be a little, little bit challenging. So I think what I'm going to do, if it's okay with people, is have Robin call the roll, understanding that this is a straw vote. This is not a, a formal vote. Is that agreeable with everybody? Okay. Yes. Um, so Robin, why don't you go ahead and call the roll? Okay. Uh, Representative Anthony. Yeah, unmute. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. We're alphabetical, just so everybody remembers you can get ready for who's next. Representative Beck. Yes. Representative Brennan. Yes. Representative Donovan. Yes. Representative Kornheiser. Yes. Representative Maslin. Yes. Representative Shy is a yes. Representative Till. Yes. Representative Young. Yes. Representative Canfield. Yes. Representative Ansel. Yes. 11 zero, zero. Okay, so if anybody ever cares what we think, we can tell them that we were unanimous. So that's good. You know, this, this is gonna be one of those bills that is gonna come up on our first floor action. And um, it's hard to know exactly how that's all gonna proceed. But, um, but if we get a chance to weigh in, we will. Um, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Damien, for being available. And, uh, Doug has dropped off, I think. But... Robin, yeah. you're very Jim. welcome. No, he's here. Thank... Oh, he's here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who is... For those listening in, this is H what? This it's is S340. S340. No. Thank you. Yeah, S... no, it's S341. S341. 341. So the other bill that we are going to do a similar um, straw vote on is S340. Um, and that bill is the Interfund Borrowing Bill. I don't have witnesses scheduled for that because we did hear from Beth Pierce about it earlier. Um, we could get it up on the screen, Sorsha, and just look at it. And if people don't feel ready to take a position, will Beth is coming on on a different issue, we can talk to her and then take a position. So I'll go with whatever the committee feels it needs. So um, I've got to pull it up on my thing here. Hold on. Um, oh, Becky Wasserman, you're here, aren't you? Yes. Yes, I'm here if you need me to, to jump on. <laughs> yeah, uh, Becky, why don't you just quickly run through it for us since I don't think we've had the bill itself presented to us. Sure, so. Oh, um, this is S340. Um, so you, as you mentioned, you, you did see the language before, um, but the, this is now in a committee bill format. Um, so this bill is um, extending um, some authority that the treasurer already has to do interfund borrowing. Um, and that authority is found in 32 VSA 436. Uh, the difference between what this bill is doing and what is already in statute is that this is specific to just F FY 2020. Um, and uh, Sorsha, if you can uh, scroll down a little. Um, the, the authority in statute gives the treasurer um, the authority to do interfund borrowing two times a year, and that is um, in a, a 15 day period um, that starts before, before the end of the fiscal year and then ends 15 days after the end of the fiscal year. And then again, there's another period um, that is that runs from about mid-December to mid-January. So this bill is simply just for FY 2020. 
um, extending the bor borrowing authority period for the end of the fiscal year. It's not talking about the December authority. Um, and it's extending it from a 15 day time, time period on both ends of the, the start of the fiscal year um, to 45 days. All right, um, let me see if committee members have questions about it. Um, curiously, I just got a, a text from Sorsha that this bill is gonna come to us. So we do have a formal position on it, but everything is sort of a surprise to me as I'm working my way through this. So, um, <laughs> so we'll take a, what we're gonna do because we don't have the bill um, is that we're going to take a we're going to do a straw vote just the way we did with um, S341. When we get possession of the bill, if we do, we will reconvene and do a formal vote. Um, we can't formally vote it; we don't have it, so um, it would get referred to us today if it does come in to us. Um, and I've just got a note that makes me think that it might come in here. So, um, with all that. Um, are there questions for um, for Becky from anyone? Bill. Yes, thank you. Uh, where it says, uh, with the approval of the governor, the treasurer may go once. Um, is this every time? Is this and this is a safeguard? So that every time the treasurer wants to move some of this money, she has to have the uh, approval of the governor. Uh, yeah, so the current law requires the approval of the governor um, for when the treasurer wants to use this authority. So this language is also appro uh, requiring approval of the governor. Thank you. And um, it, it's just two times a year. So it would only be two times that the treasurer could seek this authority. And it would be like a, a plan for borrowing from different funds, um, I assume. Right, and the language isn't up now, but there's also a, a payback requirement by okay. the end of that period that the treasurer has. So nice. um, in this instance for FY20, it's it's 45 days from the end of the fiscal year. So um, mm -hmm. June 30th, um, the treasurer would then have to pay it back on at the end of that period um, with any interest that uh, the treasurer determines. Uh, other questions that committee members have? Uh, I see that Beth Pierce is with us now. Um, so if you have questions you wanted to ask the treasurer, you can also do that. Robin. Um, thanks. What happens if there isn't enough money to pay back? Uh, so, do fund borrowing. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Beth. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so there are two backstops. So I, I think you need to introduce yourself for the record. Oh, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, for the record, Beth Pierce, the state treasurer. And uh, uh, the first line of defense in terms of, again, we believe that we are going to be able to get through the year uh, with um, uh, without um, having to, to borrow uh, even the inner fund borrowing. That said, we do have some dips in our, um, you know, peaks and valleys in our, in our, um, and our cash projections, and we want to have backup for the uh, for the um, uh, for the valleys. If the inner fund borrowing, uh, if we were not able to pay that back, if we got into that position, which I don't believe we will, we have two other. Uh, we have a plan B and a plan C after that plan A. Uh, the first being a line of credit, uh, and uh, that would um, be to, a, for, for instance, a local bank. We could set that up and 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 do that. And also the uh, statute with the approval of the governor allows the treasurer to issue short-term debt um, if, if, uh, if that was needed. Um, we have not done so since 2003 and four. That would also re uh, require the approval of the governor, um, but uh, we have that authority. Um, so we have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C to, uh, to get us through um, if, if borrowing is net necessary. Thank you. Yeah, and, and the... Um... That, that you don't need any additional authority to do the line of credit and the short-term borrowing. That's under current law. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. That is correct. And um, the, what we're talking about here, part of, part of the reason we're having this conversation is because there is a fair amount of um, 
uh, revenue that's been postponed from one fiscal year to the next? Is that part of why we're needing to create these plans? Yes, uh, yes because uh, uh, typically um, in this period of time, we have um, a peak as opposed to a valley in terms of our cash position. It does get a little tighter in, in, in that May period in any given year. But uh, uh, our cash positions are, are, are pretty solid at this time of year. Um, given the, uh, the, the, just as you said, Madam Chair, the, uh, the pushing out the, uh, the income tax and the sales tax um, has created a little bit more of a valley than we typically, a lot more of a valley than we typically have. That said, we do believe that we can, uh, we can manage within pooled cash, but this, it gets a little tight, so you might have a day or two where you need to do this, um, and this provides that backup. Yep. Good. Um, other questions for either Becky or, or uh, Beth Pierce? Are people ready to take a position on the bill, understanding that this is maybe step one in terms of uh, having a committee position? Somebody want to, uh, oh, George, go ahead. Yeah, I'd move that we <clears throat> take a committee position in favor of the of the bill as written. Okay. Second. So it's moved and seconded that we support S340. Um, and uh, this, like the previous vote, will be um, an informal vote because we don't have possession of the bill, but we'll do it with a roll call because I can't figure out where all the hands are. So. Um, so if, um, if there isn't any further discussion, uh, Robin, would you call the roll? Sure. Okay, Representative Anthony. Yes. Representative Beck. Yes. Representative Brennan. Yes. Representative Donovan. Yes. Representative Kornheiser. Yes. Representative Maslin. Yep. Representative Shy is yes. Representative Till. Yes. Representative Young. Yes. Representative Canfield. Yes. Representative Ansel. Yes. We are on a roll, 1100. We are, we are. Okay, thank you. Um, so that was our, uh, th those were the, that was the work we had to accomplish today. So that's good. Um, and now we're gonna move to a, a sort of more general discussion about the issue that we touched on, um, I think it was last week when we were looking at the, um, question, uh, Karen Horn was with us and I think she might be on this here again. Good, hi Karen. Um, the, um, the issue being um, the whether, um, whether the state or the municipalities are gonna do short-term borrowing to deal with the money that needs to go to schools and to the education fund. And one of the things that we looked at was whether um, if the municipal, if a municipality was in a position where in order to make the payment they're required to make under the statute, they needed to do short-term borrowing, if there was a way that we could, as the, at the state level, um, subsidize the interest rates and um, make sure, that, um, the reason Chris Delia is joining us, is we also want to be sure that the money is there to be borrowed, that we don't put towns in the position of saying um, short-term borrowing is one of your strategies, um, but we, you know, there's no money. Um, so we want to be sure that the money is there and that the interest rate is either um, either uh, low or no interest rate. And um, I haven't had a conversation recently with, um, with Beth Pierce about what the interest rate might be and how that would work, but she has kindly joined us to help walk us through that question. And um, this really is this whole issue about, um, about the penalties that, um, that would otherwise apply to a municipality that didn't um, didn't turn over the money that they're required to under the statute. And I, I know I can speak for everybody on the committee that um, while we might not want to remove the 8% penalty, we certainly don't want it to apply to anybody. Um, what we would much rather do is, is create a situation where towns can um, can access the money without, um, without incurring costs or keeping the costs minimal in any event. So, Beth. All right, well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I, th there is a uh, PowerPoint. I, 
Uh, it is only eight slides. I've learned to be a little more economic on the slides as we move forward in this, this process. So, um, but uh, it, um, I don't know if it's up on the screen. Um, it is. Um, I, yeah. It is, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'll walk through that. Um, so this is, um, so if you go right to page two, um, it's, it's almost what we just talked about. And, I, and it's, it's a starting point for how do we frame the, uh, the municipal argument. So you just voted out the bill on interfund borrowing. And we've talked a little bit about this um, at, um, at a previous meeting. And uh, again, I, first I wanna say thank you for, the, for, for, for voting out that bill. Um, it's uh, extraordinarily important and we appreciate that. But you see that continuum of interfund borrowing again, as we talked about it being the most efficient way to do it. Then a line of credit uh, that uh, provides uh, some flexibility as, as, you're try as you have some cash needs, it's a little more costly. Uh, to set up, um, um, and given that the other one is basically zero, uh, any cost would be an increase. And um, additional costs as you draw down money gets a little more complex when you have to do uh, a longer term um, uh, or uh, or uh, uh, a borrowing through the market, uh, whether that's uh, uh, through the new uh, through through any types of um, of um, formal borrowing. Uh, to, uh, for a uh, revenue anticipation note or tax anticipation note or the like. Um, let's go to the next page. Uh, and and uh, as I said, municipal options are similar, but yet different as we go through this. So for the municipalities, uh, what they have available to themselves right now um, is a short-term credit facility that they could do to a local banks. Uh, banks have had a wonderful history of working with us on this. Uh, I remember um, and uh, I don't know if Chris is in the room, uh, but uh, yes. we had a very, there we go. Uh, I want to thank the bankers uh, for, for, for working with us during uh, Irene and other disasters when we had the, uh, the May floods and, and the like. They stepped up to the plate um, and uh, were able to, to assist uh, municipalities with uh, short-term financing. Um, and uh, I think that was um, uh, a very tough period of time for, for um, not all municipalities across the state, but um, many. I remember the town of Halifax, uh, I think they had about a po population of about 400. I believe their budget back then was about 800,000. I think it's over a million now. And they had $4 million worth of damage. And uh, so um, uh, working that, that through, they, they were able to, do, uh, to, uh, to access credit uh, through their local banks. Uh, they have a relationship with the entities. Uh, uh, the banks have a relationship with the municipalities that they serve, and the help is available right now. Um, there is a uh, federal municipal liquidity facility um, that uh, um, that theoretically you could borrow. Uh, the state would have to borrow on their behalf because the only eligible um, um, entity to borrow out of the uh, municipal liquidity facility uh, would be the state. Um, uh, this is one of the uh, the uh, pieces out of uh, um, the, the federal government in response to COVID-19. Um, the opinion of the every, every group from the National Governors Association, uh, I presume the league, um, as well as uh, uh, treasurers and all across the board is that when you set up something like this and say that this is available and being flexible, and then, you, then the next comment is that uh, that uh, to qualify as a municipality, you have to have a population of over 1 million. Um, it kind of limits who can do this across the country on their own. There is a mechanism theoretically uh, for, for the states to do um, to borrow on behalf of the uh, municipalities. Um, there's a lot of issues with that that they have not resolved uh, and the facility is not yet operational. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, um, in, in the next slide. But uh, getting to your point, Madam Chair, about the interest and related costs for short-term borrowing may, um, um, may be possible. I'm hedging my bets there. I think it is um, uh, that uh, the reimbursement under COVID-19 um, uh, and under the, uh, the CARES Act would be reimbursable. Um, the interest would be reimbursable. So if a town was to access those local bank um, 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 uh, mechanisms and uh, those facilities that they that they they typically borrow when they when they need it. Uh, we believe that the interest would be reimbursable as well as the, any any cost associated with issuance. Um, my my reason for saying that is that um, uh, there was a conversation between NASBO, uh, the National Association of Budget Officers, I believe, and the NGA uh, with the White House and the Treasury on these issues. And uh, my understanding from from 
uh, reading the the, uh, the notes from those those meetings is that this question was specifically asked, and the answer was that these would be reimbursable. Um, but again, um, want to make sure that uh, um, um, I well, I'm, I'm confident. Um, uh, you know, I uh, want to make sure that we, uh, we 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 you know circle around this and you know and uh, make sure that uh, that we cover all all issues with it. Um, the, um, the so while municipalities can issue debt on their own, uh, they they do if they needed to do longer term, they typically uh, uh, use the bond bank, uh, with a few exceptions. You know, uh, Burlington being one of them in the past that uh, has not uh, used the bond bank in all cases. Um, uh, more recently, they have. Uh, but the bond bank is really more for infrastructure, uh, what I call the bricks and mortar um, and uh, projects and not for short term or revenue uh, borrowing such as RANs or TANs. And uh, historically, uh, while I think that you could make the case in statute they can do that, uh, historically they've never used those dollars for anything but physical infrastructure projects. Their policy is to do that. And I don't believe they're really uh, equipped at this point in time to um, to, to make that uh, Turn, nor do I believe it's necessary uh, to do that. Um, I think that uh, 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 going down the road, after you've had that short-term borrowing, if you were to need a little longer-term borrowing, and I think this program would be a really good fit given its description. Under FEMA, uh, the community disaster loans are available for municipalities. Um, this is uh, once the uh, uh, once a um, presidential disaster has um, has been declared, uh, as it has been for Vermont, uh, you are eligible for loans. Um, it's a five-year maturity, renewable up to 10 years. Um, there's a path toward forgiveness, and we're going to go over this in a little more detail in, in another slide. It does require coordination with the state. We need to understand that a little better. And FEMA typically deals with um, with disasters that are localized, uh, hurricane or tropical storm Irene, uh, uh, Hurricane Sandy, uh, some floods out in North Dakota at one point. Uh, I think under our May floods in uh, May of 11, we, we, we had some areas declared. Um, so this is a nationwide um, disaster. Uh, you know, just about every state uh, has, has declared a, uh, uh, has had a disaster declared. Um, and um, um, so I think that there may be some capacity issues in terms of FEMA. Uh, so I just wanted to point out that I don't think it's available in prime time today because it's going to take a little while to, to gear up. Um, but uh, it is an option and it's specifically designed to, um, to assist towns with revenue losses. And so it's right in the, um, uh, right in the area, uh, the ballpark that we need for this, uh, for, this uh, for, for, for intermediate borrowing. Um, I'm going to go, um, um, uh, I, I think Chris will talk a little bit more about the local banks and what they're able to do. But again, if the interest and the related um, uh, short-term borrowing costs can be reimbursed, um, I think that this is a, uh, a good fit. And I think this is, uh, I believe that's where you are heading with your thoughts, uh, Madam Chair, from, oh, from what you uh, just stop yes. me for a second. You uh, you caught my interest. You said, given yes. um, a, a couple things, you think this is a good fit, and I'm not sure what you were referring to when you said this. Uh, I think the short term uh, borrowing through the local banks with the uh, 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 with the presumed option that we would be able to pay the interest in um, in related costs um, uh, either in whole or part uh, through through. Um, um, uh, the uh, the COVID nineteen dollars uh, is is a good fit. Right. So not not what I'm looking at on the slide. Um, when you're talking, when you said this, you were talking about this general idea about having um, municipalities do short term borrowing uh, through local banks and having the state uh, subsidize the interest um, and uh, yes. get, get that reimbursed by through COVID nineteen. It, uh, that it? would be that would be the uh, the recommendation. Okay. Uh, again, right. you know, there's some there's some dotting of the eyes and crossing of the T's, yeah. but I think it's something that's doable. Okay, all right. Uh, I got distracted go by the slides, and I wasn't sure if you were referring to something ah. that was on the slide. That's okay. Okay, I tend to put too much on a. Uh, nope, I've got less good. slides this time, but I still put too much on a page. Okay, yeah. no, that's fine. I just uh, clarified. Yeah. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk uh, about the this something called the municipal liquidity facility. Um, and it's on slide four. And again, um, what that did is it was it was trying to do two things. It was one stabilizing the market because um, 
municipal the municipal borrowing market has been kind of choppy. Rates have gone up, rates have gone down. It's an issue of uh, that I talked a little bit about in my last presentation, so I won't, you know, re re um, go over the entire the entire piece on that. But uh, it um, uh, it did in fact help stabilize the market, uh, so that's a good thing. Um, it uh, it provides its one. Uh, that all states are eligible, and as I said, um, uh, uh, municipalities with a population of at least one million residents. So I think that leaves out Vermont. Uh, but um, uh, you could, the, the state theoretically could borrow money on behalf of the um, of the municipalities through this um, um, this 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 um, facility. Uh, but there are a, a number of problems with it. Uh, it does provide some options for the state. Um, should we need to get into that? And it does provide for a two-year um, um, uh, uh, borrowing that could be used in other other things that are needed outside of the uh, the short-term borrowing needs that we're talking about today. So if you I, go to slide. So I, I'm going to interrupt again just to be sh just so that That's I don't right. get confused by the details. The the um, the the we have an immediate fiscal twenty problem. Um, with yes. the towns having due dates that, you know, for either giving the money to the Ed Fund or giving the money to the mm -hmm. schools. Um, and it's, it, if, uh, tell me if I'm misunderstanding this, but it, it sounds to me as though one option um, would be for the municipalities to do short-term borrowing with their local banks, having the interest yep. rate subsidized by the state, reimbursed by COVID-19. We then have continuing problems, I am sure, in fiscal 21. I think we're, um, we, we need to be sort of preparing for those. Um, and um, it sounds to me from what you're saying as though these other tools, um, like the municipal liquidity facility and the, um, the FEMA money, may be fiscal 21 resources more than they are in 20. Is that, is that right? Uh, absolutely correct, Madam Chair. Uh, um, much, I think you could do this presentation for me. But, no, uh, I'm just trying to understand. I, 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 <laughs> no, I'm so no, out of my league when I talk about uh, a liquidity facility um, that I just want to I want to put it in yeah. something that I can understand. No, um, I think totally that, out of my yeah. league. I, I don't think so uh, on that, but uh, you are right on in the analysis. So okay. I, I do believe that uh, the municipal liquidity facility might be something that, uh, you know, we could go out and do borrowing and we may in fact decide that that yeah. would be the route if we were talking about a structural deficit uh, that could not be resolved. Um, and, you know, if there are structural deficits, we're still going to have to have some conversation on what that does with the rating agencies and in terms of our credit. But I think there's a tad more flexibility uh, this year, uh, it's open for discussion. We've got some more work to do on it, but I think that the liquidity facility would be something that I would recommend for 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 a review uh, for state borrowing uh, with with respect to that. Perhaps the Ed Fund is, uh, if depending on where we are with the with the Ed Fund, where we are with the facility and uh, and our uh, and and what our other options might be. I don't think it's necessarily a a good fit uh, for municipal borrowing at this point in time. Um, and if you go to page five, um, the reasons are, are, are there. Um, uh, what the current leg eligibility levels, you know, lack, communities lack direct access to funding. Uh, theoretically, again, they could borrow um, uh, through the state. Um, there are a lot of pieces that haven't been addressed with that. Um, and frankly, the facility is not up and running. Uh, what we hear from various sources is it would take, it's about three to six weeks out from having guidance. And I don't know what uh, happens in terms of implementation uh, period of time. Uh, there is a fa uh, F uh, fact portal that's going on. We can put in questions. Uh, they're probably likely to come out with some type of uh, sheet in the next two weeks, but it's not quite ready for prime time is I guess what, I, what I'm saying there. And there are a number of questions, you know, who's going to manage this program, what are the pricing um, uh, terms, the, the, the appropriate vehicles uh, that you could, you could use. Uh, I did not write in here, but disclosure requirements that might be there, um, a potential need for Vermont statutory changes, but we haven't seen the, the guidance yet to help us with that. Um, is this a state credit or a municipal credit? Um, in other words, are we assuming the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, 
uh, obligations for these uh, uh, for the municipal debt under this model. Uh, what are the credit implications for the state and, and its bonding capacity? Um, you know, there's an intercept program. How does that work and how does that um, uh, interact with the, the current intercept program for the bond bank? Um, you know, it, is this the best vehicle if you're talking about structural deficits and its cost uh, versus a bank line of credit? Uh, although, again, if, if uh, this, it looks like we can we can have an option where the, those costs are are picked up by the state, um, as as we discussed earlier, so I don't think that this would be the intermediate step to deal with uh, with um, uh, revenue losses and, uh, and and any any uh, structural deficits that a municipality might have. Again, as you pointed out, not in fiscal year 20, but fiscal year 21. However, I do believe that the community disaster loan uh, program would would provide that opportunity, um, as well as uh, uh, municipality could could go out and do bonding on its own. Uh, the problem with that is that most of the municipalities do not have their own credit ratings, um, and uh, 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 they rely on the bond bank. And again, this is outside of what uh, would would be um, uh, uh, the the. Uh, area of, of uh, the business model of, of the bond bank. But the community disaster loan is authorizing language already in statute. I won't go through that here, that's slide six, um, but it is it is something that's already um, in, in statute that would allow us to do this program. Uh, so I wanted to make that clear, it wouldn't require a statutory change. Um, and if you go to page seven, uh, this is a little bit about what it, uh, the, 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 the details that, um, of the program. Um, it provides uh, uh, for operate uh, for funding of uh, operations uh, operational funding for governments uh, that have had a substantial revenue loss caused by disaster. I think that all that one sentence fits in entirely to what uh, what I, uh, what we are facing now in terms of um, in terms of the uh, the virus and its impacts on uh, on local and state revenues. Uh, this program would be for municipalities. It would not be for uh, for the state itself. Uh, local governments can apply if they if there's a presidential declared disaster area. So we've reached that substantial loss of revenue that uh, is greater than or equal to five percent. Um, and again, we uh, can't I can't uh, assess where that would be at this point. But if you did have more than five percent of a revenue loss, this would be a program uh, that uh, that you would be uh, municipality would be eligible for. Um, it affects both the current and the in the subsequent fiscal year. So it would uh, you would uh, be able to take a look in terms of uh, the current year, so fiscal year 20 as well as 21, uh, for eligibility for that program and to to address the revenue needs. Um, the amount can be up to 25 percent of the annual operating budget, uh, but no more than five million. Um, the term is generally five years, but you can extend it to 10 years. And this is the part that I really like about it, the next bullet. If you, the, the municipality had a um, um, three-year operating budget, cumulative three-year operating deficit, um, you can apply to the CDL, uh, to, the, to FEMA, uh, to have all of uh, part of the loan uh, qualify uh, for cancellation. And so um, forgiveness of a loan um, um, is an option here. Uh, which is not available in other options as we're moving through uh, through through the uh, spectrum of opportunities in uh, for borrowing. Um, interest only accrues on a portion that is drawn down by the applicant. It's a little like the line of credit. I do need to um, to clarify that a little bit with the uh, folks um, at FEMA. And there is a fact sheet, um, and uh, 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 there's a link to that. Uh, the process going to page eight. Um, is outlined there in terms of you know determining eligibility. So FEMA would send a, a staff person to talk or, or have a staff person available to talk with the municipality. Uh, in 2011, we brought an individual from FEMA to 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 reach out to uh, to communities on this. Ultimately, communities had a uh, thanks to your efforts in the in the General Assembly um, in the administration had an option uh, that uh, was. Um, um, uh, uh, more beneficial to communities, so they they did not opt in this direction. But um, um, we um, uh, uh, they would have an evaluation of the of the, you know looking at their audit statements, looking at their revenue projections. Uh, they go through that process. They submit an application. Uh, the government does have some state needs to have an authorized representative um, to work with FEMA. 
Uh, while the treasurer's office has been putting together uh, the uh, uh, the materials on this this particular option, uh, we would see that another uh, department of the administration, uh, uh, a department of the administration, uh, we're not part. We are a separate constitutional office, but uh, would 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 be the lead on that. Although we would want to sign off on the uh, on the loan applications in terms of a of a uh, financial review and its implications for the uh, for the state. Um, it does have to have a state sign off, um, and uh, uh, again, it uh, I think it's a viable option uh, for uh, for that uh, taking out that short term debt. So I think the banks would be available for that short term debt, um, and uh, Chris can talk about capacity there and some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, specifics. Uh, but uh, and then eventually you'd want to take that uh, short term uh, loan out, and this would provide. A uh, intermediate to a longer-term solution for uh, the municipalities to soften the blow and to essentially smooth out those uh, revenue problems over um, over a five-year period, or presumably longer, with some option for forgiveness. Um, I will stop there and then answer any questions uh, that uh, uh, the committee may have. Alrighty. Um, maybe before I go to questions, uh, we'll hear from Chris Delia so that we've got some idea about the capacity of the local banks. Um, but the question I'm going to ask you um, is if we, if this is a path that we decide to pursue, um, do we need legislation? And if we do, what would that look like? Um, so that, okay. just be prepared with that. Yeah. Uh, Chris uh, Delia, come, thank you for joining us. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to visit with you, Chris Delia, President of the Vermont Bankers Association. I want to thank Treasurer Pierce for doing a great job of outlining those various resources. I'll just comment on one of them. Uh, we had uh, higher hopes for the municipal lending facility or liquidity facility that was announced by the feds. It's very disappointing that they did not take into consideration the context of a small state. Um, it's also a bit disappointing because we were hopeful they may create some type of uh, secondary market mechanism, if you will, that if loans were initiated, um, we could potentially sell those loans into the secondary market. It is uh, possible on the PPP program, but uh, I haven't heard really anything on the municipal side. Um, I will share with you, I was on a call on Monday where we are <clears throat> expecting to see some new guidance being released by Treasury later this week that would speak to state and municipalities being able to use COVID funds. Um, there was no more detail on that, but it looks like there may be some greater opportunity to access that first tranche of COVID funds yeah. that was released very early in the, uh, in the crisis. And again, guidance coming out hopefully soon uh, and Treasurer Pierce is right on with the guidance from the Federal Reserve on the uh, MLF program uh, at this point. Uh, it's a bit frustrating, although we applaud their efforts, it's a bit frustrating when you have a program that's announced and you don't have all of the infrastructure behind the scenes to actually get it off the ground. Um, that said, municipal lending in Vermont. So uh, you'll recall, uh, and again, the Treasurer alluded to it during Tropical Storm Irene, we were uh, very involved with municipalities on the short-term lending side. In that case, it was to help them rebuild infrastructure quickly. So we worked with municipalities to get funding to help build those roads and bridges and, and uh, culverts and so on. Knowing uh, at that time that the long-term piece of the financing would be dealt with by the bond banks. So we provided the short-term access to capital and then the bond bank stepped in it at a later date and took that short-term mechanism out and, and provided the long-term financing. So we're used to this model, um, if you will, but the context is obviously quite different. Um, we're not talking about infrastructure, we're talking about property taxes and the scale of it. <laughs> is uh, statewide versus the uh, municipalities that were impacted by Tropical Storm Irene. That said, I've been in communication with my membership on a daily basis. We've talked about municipalities on several occasions and I can tell you um, that our banks are either having conversations as we speak or had conversations 
and are open to having conversations with municipalities around the state to discuss their short-term lending needs. Um, the, the issue with municipal lending is uh, a bit different in the fact that you've got a, a, an entity that has taxing capacity, which makes it a bit easier, if you will, in those lending discussions. You have banks and municipalities that have long established relationships, not only on the lending side, but just on everyday transactional accounts uh, that they're used to working with. So there's no uh, doubt in my mind, having talked with my membership, that they will be there to work with the municipalities. It will be on a case by case basis based on the unique circumstances of the needs of that municipality. And I only have one institution that has said they, they will not be participating because they don't have a municipal lending portfolio. They don't have a municipal lender on staff. Otherwise they would. So that's, uh, that's good news. And I think, as you know, we have 23 members in our association. And so that's 22 out of 23 that have expressed positive interest in working with the municipalities. Um, I had an example given to me last night, I won't mention the town, but it is down in your uh, freshman to your committee, Emily Kornheiser's district, regarding a community that has just set up a financial relationship and loan with a local institution down there. So it's, it's happening, it's going to happen. And I feel confident that uh, our folks will be able to meet those short-term needs. As far as the capacity to do it, um, that's something that is in the back of my mind right now because uh, as you've heard the news, the capacity of putting a billion dollars out the door for PPP lending is one that uh, is just absolutely incredible. That's all bank funds that have gone out the door. So now we find ourselves in a position of having to find vehicles that we can borrow from so that we can continue to do these loans. In the case of PPP, it's going to be a Federal Reserve program that they've got up and running. We're also looking at what the Federal Home Loan Bank might make available to us. Um, but regardless, we'll figure out a way to access capital to make sure that the needs of Vermonters are met. And, and this is not just municipal needs, it's not just PPP, it's also all of the other financial uh, relief, if you will, or adjustments that have been made for individuals and businesses ever since the crisis began. So I'll thank stop you. there. Happy to answer no, any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Peter, Anthony. Uh, thank you very much. I wanted to thank Chris. Uh, he, he said it uh, right on. That is to say, it has to be a market to uh, re-inject, so to say, some liquidity into the local banks in order for them to do what I know Chris wants them to do and we want them to do, which is cover short-term municipal loans. But uh, my, my question as it came up was really to Beth Pierce. Uh, back in the uh, slide that talked about the FEMA uh, municipal disaster loans uh, that generally are multiple year loans. And I'm, uh, my ears perked up when uh, Treasurer Pierce mentioned uh, that if uh, a municipality would run a deficit in excess of 5% uh, for more than three years, there was a forgiveness uh, um, uh, stipulation. And as uh, I think my colleagues have pointed out in another context, school districts in Vermont are municipalities. And I'm just wondering if that isn't uh, an opp opportunity to get around uh, the dilemma for FY21 we're facing, namely, unless Congress uh, allows, we cannot backfill lost revenues nor can schools. Um, and I'm just wondering if a, um, if a statewide strategy uh, to try to utilize that FEMA uh, on the understanding that there's a certain risk because we'd be asking school districts to purposely um, uh, run a deficit uh, in the expectation that whatever loan they took out to fill that gap would be forgiven after three or four years. Uh, whatever Secretary Pierce uh, uh, light uh, she could shine on that as to whether I'm going down a, a dead end or it's a useful inquiry. Thank you.
I, um, I don't hear a response. Um, maybe it's something. Uh, Beth Pierce, are you there? Uh, yes, I am, but I had put it on mute during Chris's conversation, so I'm back. Uh, my apologies there. <laughs> That's okay. Um, uh, technology is a wonderful thing. But uh, uh, what I would say is that uh, while it's a good question, I think that the idea of running a purposeful deficit and then asking um, uh, the Fed to um, to essentially forgive the loan would probably not be an option if that's, if that's the question, um, if I'm interpreting that correctly, sir. My understanding is uh, unless we undertake extraordinary measures uh, in mm -hmm. FY21, the Ed Fund will run a deficit, and yep. it's not intentional. Yeah, yep. uh, no, I, I understand at the, at the at our level, but I, I guess what I'm saying in terms of uh, the municipality, uh, uh, in terms of its uh, receipts coming in, um, and I I agree with you. I think that uh, the municipal loan uh, liquidity fund would be the um, uh, the way to address um, uh, potential deficits and structural deficits for the state. Um, and the CDL, uh, the Community Disaster Loan, uh, would be the option for, uh, uh, for municipalities. Uh, the forgiveness would be at their level, uh, whether or not they've had, you know, in addition to Ed Funds and other property tax, if they experience a, uh, a, a, a three-year cumulative uh, um, operating deficit. And forgive me for misunderstanding the question. Well, what you just said actually is helpful to me because I keep trying to categorize things. So we've got the fiscal 20 problem and I don't want to lose sight of that because that's why we're here. Um, and we've got two paths um, as I'm understanding the conversation for fiscal 21. One is the municipal liquidity fund uh, facility, which you say would be a state um, path. Um, and the other is the, the FEMA money, which we, you're describing as a potential path for municipalities. We don't need to decide those now um, because we're not gonna take any action on them right now. Um, we do need to, um, but, and tell me if I, I think I understood that that's what you were uh, describing, um, but I wanna be sure that we go back to fiscal 20 and um, make sure that we have a plan um, for, uh, getting through what we know is going to be extremely challenging for municipalities, for taxpayers, and for the state, um, going uh, uh, setting us up for additional problems in fis fiscal 21. Jim Maslin. Thank you. Um, Beth, I'm exceedingly impressed with the breadth and width of the um, things that may be available. It's astounding, really. How, how we get to them, those are good questions. Peter's questions are good questions and I'm sure there are many around the room, um, but I'm uh, astounded, very, very pleased, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's encouraging to know that there are gonna be some choices, even though we don't, they may not, may not have guidance on them yet, we may, may not fully understand exactly where they're gonna be most useful and how to access them, but it is, it is very encouraging. Uh, Emily. Thanks. I have two very separate questions. Um, one, I'm curious with the FEMA funds. Normally, um, we don't have a national disaster that um, covers the whole nation. And so I'm curious if there's the opportunity or the potential for money to run out in that fund in a way that's very different from where, how it would with a much smaller or more localized disaster. Um, and then if I could answer, ask the other question after that. Okay, so uh, we are looking at that right now, um, and uh, there, there was some more money that was sent to uh, to FEMA uh, through some of these acts. We, we need to take a look at that. We agree. I mean, there was a, I think I mentioned the last time there was an article in Governing Magazine said that, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the, the vi uh, with respect to the virus, the, uh, the hurricane felt, uh, the hurricane experience across the country. So as a, uh, we are, uh, so that is one consideration. We are taking a look at that. I ha haven't heard anything from the representatives that we have talked to um, at FEMA that uh, this would be an issue. I think the bigger issue for us is capacity uh, for, the, for the number of staff they have to, um, um, to address the problem. Uh, and uh, uh, for me, getting someone out uh, here to, to, to work with us, which was the model in 2011, um, is going to be much exceedingly difficult this time, and uh, which is why those short-term loans uh, through the uh, through the bank, the uh, lines of credit, 
would be very advantageous because it gives you a continuum of opportunities. So we would work through that uh, those CDL issues uh, why the uh, uh, the uh, the short term borrowing is um, uh, uh, or short term lines of credit are available. You know, if this is not an option, you know, getting to um, to uh, the chair's point, you know, with we're, we're we're looking ahead into 21. Uh, we we would we certainly can continue to look at other options as well. Um, we think that this is viable, uh, but uh, again, as you pointed out, it's a, it's a changing environment. Uh, getting back to the chair's comment in 2020, as we're looking at uh, the um, the availability of um, of, uh, of a borrowing facility for uh, for, for localities, um, it exists. And uh, if, if we can address the issue of the interest payments, um, uh, which I believe we can, and uh, I think that uh, there's there's an option that gets us to the point where we can get into those transitional to uh, to longer term models uh, or longer term uh, facilities for uh, for municipalities. Emily, go ahead. Thanks. Um, and my dog chose this moment to get worried about something. So if that gets loud, I'm sorry. Um, my other question is about the cost of borrowing for towns versus the cost of borrowing for the state and how much more expensive it is for towns to borrow, even if we're the, um, how much we'd be spending paying the cost of their interest compared to, to if we were borrowing. Does that make sense? Well, uh, it certainly does. You know, when we're, if we were to be borrowing, uh, you know, it's very difficult. Uh, we're, we're trying to understand what that municipal facility would look like. Um, and uh, and with the, they have not given us any any such uh, indication on pricing. They have said that uh, the rating uh, that uh, that a that a state has would be a uh, uh, factor in, in this, but uh, they have not uh, given us uh, what the disclosure and uh, underwriting requirements would be. So working with an investment bank, for instance, would those costs be? You know, when we go out and we do borrowing, there's uh, there's a significant cost of issuance, uh, and uh, you know we would have to. Uh, um, presumably have um, um, continue to have those. Um, you know, I can't tell you what they what the pricing versus a bank. I will tell you that back in um, in in 2011, the banks gave very low interest rates to to assist communities. Um, uh, it sounds like a very high interest rate today, but um, uh, back in 2011, I remember one bank uh, down in um, uh, down in the southern part of the state on the New Hampshire border was giving. Um, um, you know, one percent loans for uh, for a year, and at that point, that was an extraordinarily competitive rate. Not so much today, but uh, as you're working through these things. But I think the banks have showed that they're not uh, that, that they're working with their communities and giving a, a a decent price. Right now, without having the model for the municipal facility um, uh, or, or an answer to those questions about pricing, and I will tell you that uh, the various Groups that represent um, um, the uh, the investment community have asked for those. Um, without having that, it would be impossible to fully answer that question. Uh, but it is something we're all asking. Um, and there's a very um, uh, uh, NABO, the National Association of Bond Lawyers. Um, I was going to say there's a very clear letter, which is uh, something uh, um, that you don't see usually with uh, uh, with um, um, uh, bond councils. Uh, um, across the country, but there's a very clear letter with a clear ask, and that's one of the asks that we, that they have, as well as um, my our, the associations I'm involved with. Thank you. I'll Thank just you. add to that, Emily, that um, I'll try and get some rough ideas for you in the committee as to what pricing might look like. I actually just sent an email to a municipal lender, so maybe before we get off, I'll be able to give you just a rough ballpark, but I'll see if I can come up with something for you. Um, did I understand the earlier testimony, though, that um, that the interest would be uh, reimbursable under um, the CARES Act? Did uh, this is Beth. Yes, this is Beth Pierce. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, that is our understanding. And it's the understanding that we have based on conversations uh, with uh, the NGA Na and NASBO with uh, the White House and the tre and uh, the, the, the Treasury Department. So, not that um, that money is unlimited, but just um, and there may yes. and maybe other there may be other sources. Um, I know they're working on another bill, um, so it's possible that there would be some uh, another source. But it, but it's it's a it's a good question. 
um, but we need to factor in how much of it um, we can recoup as well. Um, yes. So if there are, are there other questions for um, uh, Chris Belia or Beth Pierce at the moment? Um, I, I So um, I'm gonna give you a chance to weigh in if you want to, Karen, but bef just because I don't wanna forget to say this, I'm gonna uh, first of all ask um, if, um, I guess it would be you, Beth, um, could work with whoever you need to work with on our staff and, um, and with the banks and so on to let us know what you would need for legislation to do this and um, give us some framework for it because I don't know if legislation is needed, um, but if it is, I'd like to see what it is. This is understanding that we haven't taken a position on it, but, um, but I would like to have it in front of us so that we could take a position if we decided that we wanted to pursue this. Um, Karen, I want to give you a minute to, uh, I know you've been listening, I know you weren't on the schedule to testify, but if you wanted to say a few words, I wanted to give you a chance to do that. Uh, thank you, Karen Horn with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and uh, thank you, Treasurer Pierce, for, for that information. Uh, we are a little bit concerned about the community disaster loan. It was has not been used in Vermont before and um, FEMA tends to have a lot of strings attached to um, their financing uh, so, that, so that sometimes it's not actually workable for local governments. So that's one concern we have there. I am, um, I, I also wanted to mention and I don't have a response from my attorneys yet, but my understanding is that towns um, under the statute are not allowed to carry deficits forward um, year over year. So I will get um, the, the statutory reference for that. And that might be one thing that we would need to address. Um, and then uh, I am curious as to what was the lending alternative that was available to towns in 2011. I'm afraid my brain cells don't go back that far right now. So um, it would be helpful to know what that looks like. Yeah. And I think that's Madam, all I have right now, Madam Chair. I'm sorry? I think that's all I have right now. No, that's fine. And I've got a couple other things that I want to deal with before noon. So we're not going to get all the way through this. Um, uh, I think the next step is to, is to look at something um, so that we're not talking in a vacuum. Um, so I, I just would ask if people could um, could do that. I didn't know, Beth, were you wanting to answer Karen's question? Uh, yes, if that's a, okay, Madam Chair. Of course. Well, uh, I think that uh, the takeout last time uh, was the bond bank um, so that you did short-term loans and then the bond bank stepped in to do longer-term loans with residual after, uh, after the FEMA re reimbursement. The difference here is that uh, the, the bond bank's um, uh, role has been uh, infrastructure uh, as opposed to, to revenue, um, uh, uh, dealing with revenue shortfalls. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a very different um, uh, situation. So we, we don't see the bond bank as the, um, as the primary um, um, uh, option here. We, again, we believe that the banks can provide that short term, and then we can work with you to uh, to come up with that intermediate um, option. And uh, I agree with you that the CDL is a little complicated, but we're going to stand there with you and work that through. And um, you know, I'm committed to uh, to uh, to working with the General Assembly, this committee uh, in particular, to to make that work. Um, so. Uh, um... I just uh, sort of made this general request to have um, uh, folks work on a proposal. Is that something that you can help us with, Beth? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I just wanted to be sure I close the loop somehow. Um, one last question, Peter. I've got to move on, but I see you have your hand up. Ab absolutely. I just want to be clear. Uh, I thank you very much for r reminding me and the committee that we have the immediate problem of FY20. And the help for the towns, oftentimes people use descriptors. Uh, I've heard two versions of help. 
One is that the state essentially absorb uh, any and all interest that otherwise the towns would have would incur uh, owing to late property tax payments. The other version is because the state can borrow more advantageously competitively, we should offer the towns essentially the state rate while they are working internally to solve their problems vis-a-vis -vis submission uh, of um, um, property tax funds to the uh, state of Vermont. So which are, which are we on? And I wanna be clear that, that we do identify which of those two variations uh, when we try to refine this uh, strategy. Thank you. Do you want me to respond to that, Madam Chair? Sure. Sure. So I think that uh, the model that um, I would see as the most viable would to be use the local banks. Uh, they would do the loan. Um, there would be an interest cost associated with that that would be reimbursed by the state. Uh, we don't know what the interest cost would be under the uh, municipal facility, um, uh, municipal liquidity facility, um, if in fact um, uh, it, it's a viable option. Um, and we do know that um, us bonding with our 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 facility and then reimbursing uh, to the um, the towns create some other issues that I would I would have to to look at that are much more complex. So I think that the most viable option, frankly, are, is the banks uh, with our our um, uh, providing uh, um, some interest uh, related support. And uh, I would trust that the banks are going to do a competitive, I mean, a a very reasonable rate. Um, uh, they've done that in the past. Uh, they've been good partners. And I think that they will continue to be good partners. And uh, again, I want to thank you, uh, Representative, for this question and, and, and other, the other questions. I think that uh, uh, it, it um, uh, reflects a lot of uh, thoughtfulness on, on your part, as well as the entire committee on, on these issues. And um, um, I, I love having conversations like this that are so informed. And I thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for, uh, for giving us this forum. So um, we're going to move. We're going to shift gears. But um, uh, can you let Sorsha know um, when we can expect a proposal to review, and then uh, I'll, work, I'll work with her on setting up uh, um, some sort of a uh, review process um, with you. Okay, we'll do that. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. It's nice Thank to you. see you. Thank you. Um, I've got just, this is for, I don't have witnesses. Well, maybe I do. I don't think I have witnesses on these things. I just wanted to touch on a few things that are um, uh, perking around. Um, one is we had the uh, joint meeting with House Education on what I call the unadopted budgets, um, which is the 20 budgets, some of which were defeated and some of which, oops, sorry. Yikes. Um, I apologize for that. Um, some of which were defeated and some of which had never been proposed. Um, and there was, um, some of us are, have been working on a proposal which incorporates what the Senate bill um, did, but uh, expands on it. Um, it's really gonna be a committee bill coming out of House Education, but when it's read, and they're the ones who are doing the bulk of the work on it. But when it's ready, um, I will will either have another joint meeting or it will get presented to this committee as well. Like a lot of these things, I'm not sure whether we'll have possession of the bill, um, but we will want to take a position on it. And I thought the meeting that we had jointly with them was a good meeting and uh, wanted to try to build on that. So um, just know that that's coming. Um, that there qu aren't questions on that. Um, the um, other couple things I wanted to mention. Tom Cavett is going to speak to, um, we're going to have a joint meeting with House Appropriations next week to get an update on revenue. This is not a new revenue forecast. They're not able to make one at this point, um, but it's an update. We've been getting kind of, he's been doing them sort of daily or weekly, but um, is at a point where things have a few things have gelled enough to actually have something that's um, that I think we ought to present to the committee. Um, and I, I'm, I'm losing track of the dates that we're doing things because of the House floor actions moved us around some. I think, Sorsha, our meetings next week are um, to, uh, what day are they? 
Um, you cut out a little bit, Janet. Um, do you mean sorry. the joint meeting tomorrow? Uh, it's okay. Are we no, talking about no, I'm talking time? about our meeting times for next week. Um, well, we have the um, joint hearing with House Appropriations at no. 9 a.m. on oh, I'm Wednesday, sorry. Yes. the 29th. On the 29th. Okay. And that what day yes. of the week is that? That's Wednesday. That's Wednesday. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, but the floor, the floor times haven't come out yet, so we don't have just the new them. schedule for next week yet. I think you got. I think you got oh, you them. Did. I just got them. Um, okay. So, um, so anyway, so that so that's one thing we're going to do next week. I just wanted to flag for people. I'm sorry that my my connection's bad. So my apologies. Um, the um, other two things that are happening, uh, Senate Government Operations has voted out a bill that would allow towns to waive penalties and interest for property tax payments, including education tax payments in fiscal 20. Those are the ones that are imminently due. Um, and Senate Finance is looking at that proposal. They have some concerns about it. I have some concerns about it. Um, just know that that may come, that will come in the committee because it is important if it deals with the education tax that it come in here. Um, and they're, they're, one of the reasons for having this discussion this morning is to uh, see if we can come up with an alternative that will actually um, protect the Ed Fund which means protecting property taxpayers as much as we can um, and uh, try to avoid the worst um, uh, issues in 21, um, trying to at least ameliorate some of what we see coming in 21 because it doesn't look good. Um, it was interesting, I actually listened to their meeting. Um, I kept sort of sitting there saying, I wanted to jump in. <laughs> And I couldn't, I was just observing. So I had to keep my mouth shut, it was hard. Um, the uh, other piece is the joint fiscal committee document. And do you have that Sorsha to post? Um, I wanna just run through it with the committee um, so people know what it's being proposed. Am I still cutting out all the time? Not too bad. Okay. Robin says I'm okay. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a document. Um, so the Joint Fiscal Committee uh, has met twice now on um, this, um, how we're going to deal with the CRF. CRF is the, what I call the CARES grant, but it's the CRF grant um, to Vermont. The 1.25 billion is in has arrived and it's in a bank um, now and it's I'm getting moved around. I guess Steve Klein should be giving this presentation, not me, but I'll try to remember what he said. Um, so that's in that's here, um, and because it's a grant, um, it's the Joint Fiscal Committee that accepts the grant. That's under our current statute, um, and what we are. Uh, proposing to do, and this has not been um, approved by the full committee, but the concept has been discussed by the committee, um, is to accept the grant with these conditions that are in this document that I'm posted here. Um, and that's it, what it really does. Um, and my apologies, we just got it this morning and we got um, sign off from leadership on it. Um, it basically says that there's a certain amount of money in the grant that has already been spent or needs to be available to the administration to spend quickly. Um, and we don't wanna tie the administration's hands, particularly when health and safety are, are at issue. This would be something like um, paying for ventilators or paying for test kits or something uh, P PPE. Um, there may be other things as well. And the amount of money that we're suggesting gets set aside for that category is six, up to $60 million. It's a lot of money. Um, but we know the administration has committed, has already spent some of that money. So some of it we're approving retroactively. Um, if you can move up a little bit, 
Sorsha. Um, sorry, the, yeah, then the next. Um, and for that pocket of money, uh, the committee is going to, would be informed through regular reporting of the use and expenditure of that money. Um, and it would be posted on the Joint Fiscal Committee website so that people would be aware of it. Um, there's another um, uh, category of money, which are items that um, need, where the money needs to be uh, spent, allocated and, and spent um, before we can get a budget passed. Um, you know, we, we're still, hopefully tomorrow we'll approve remote vote, approve remote voting, um, but we haven't done that yet. And the budget hasn't been developed because we don't have a good revenue forecast. Um, so there, there's, a, um, we're still in a position where we're operating under the original fiscal 20 budget. Um, and so for the, the time sensitive critical needs that can't wait for the appropriations process, there is another 150 million up to another 150 million that needs prior joint fiscal committee approval. And those, um, those expenditures would be, um, they'd happen quickly because that's the nature of the situation that we're in. Um, but we're working on a way to notify um, certainly the chairs of the relevant policy committees, but I think probably every member as soon as those requests come in. Um, and then the, so people, so the relevant committee would have very short time frame, but would have an opportunity to uh, weigh in um, and the money can't, the way this is structured, the money couldn't be spent without the joint fiscal committee approval. And then the rest of the money, which is the great bulk of it, will go through the appropriations process, um, which is what we're used to. We all get to vote on it. We all get to see it ahead of time. Um, and um, that's where I do the math quickly, but that's a little over a billion dollars. We'll go through that regular appropriation process. So um, I wanted, because we're a money committee, even though we're not the budget committee, I wanted to be sure that committee members knew what the joint fiscal committee was looking at and considering and sort of how the, how the um, structure is recommended um, that it flow. So um, this has not been voted on by the committee, but it would be the joint fiscal committee that would ultimately uh, uh, agree to this or change it and agree to it or whatever. And they've, they've, seen a, they have a general idea. I mean, we had a meeting where we went over this, we just didn't have the language in front of us. So Robin. Um, thanks, this is really helpful, Janet, to know what's happening here. I'm just wondering if you have any examples of what you think would be that 150 million for time sensitive critical needs that can't go through the approach process. Was there? But, so I, I'm the only one that's popping in my head, and I don't know if it's the right example, but the $1,200 checks that went out to everybody, for example. Okay, right. now, I, think, I think that's UI money, so maybe it's not COVID money anyway. No. Um, but that, you know, really short time frame, right. but that could have um, gone through that kind of process. Um, that probably a whole lot of others um, right. that I'm not thinking of. And the, what we really wanted is we wanted to be sure that we gave the administration uh, the flexibility to be able to act really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but where we felt we could build in a period of time where they needed to have um, a, a legislative review and approval, even though it's a committee, um, right. it, we wanted to be able, wanted to do that. So yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Others may have better ideas, but yeah. Uh, Peter. I just have one other example. I'm willing to bet that some of the time sensitive needs arise from the um, un, uh, um, lost revenue from hospitals and the fact that some of them are, are literally on the edge of cash flow, uh, on a cash flow basis. But uh, to, to the uh, other point, uh, you chose in the intermediate 150 million and then in the first instance, right away, uh, the other lower figure, was there some showing by the administration which uh, satisfied you that those are the right numbers, that they shouldn't be lower or higher? You know, they're, they're up to in both cases. Um, we've had conversations with the administration. Um, I, uh, 
don't remember if we had these exact figures the last time we had a conversation with them, um, but the, the, the um, we, wanted, we wanted it to be high enough to be able to accommodate what we envision happening, but at the same time, if, if only a hundred million has been committed and they come in with something that we think belongs in the budget, then we say no um, to it. So I, I think there's enough flexibility around the edges that it will work, but um, you know, it's, it's an informed um, guess. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there any other questions anyone has? Um, anything else anybody wants to ask about or weigh in on? We are going to meet Friday. Um, and I think one of the things we may know more about this um, bill that Senate Government Operations voted out um, by then uh, that might be on the agenda. Um, and uh, if not, I'm, I may ask, um, may get an update on, um, on, a, on a couple of the ed fund issues and so on. That's my biggest worry, obviously, George. Um, speaking of the ed fund, <clears throat> did I <clears throat> understand properly um, from the joint fiscal office note last evening that um, instead of 89 million of lost revenue, it's 69 million for the wheels and rooms and the sales tax? Yes. Yeah, there, there was a calculation error, as I was told. Um, I, I kept thinking, oh, maybe it's good news, right? Everything is much better than we think, but no. Um, but yes, it's, so it's, it's slightly better, but remember it does, it, it assumes that all the money comes in, um, you know, all the property tax money for fiscal 20 and so on. So, um, but yes, it is, uh, it is slightly improved. Yeah, I'll take a $20 million upgrade anytime. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Although I wish it was the better economy. That was what I was hoping for. But anyway, uh, Robin. Yeah. Was that an email that we got that I've missed? <laughs> Possibly. Um, where that came from? Uh, I don't remember. I know it went out. Um, Sorsha, if... Uh, um, it was an email that I... It was an email. I, 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 I'll look. I don't know about the rest of you, but I get so many at this point. That, yes. Um, yeah. And all the Zoom meetings, I'm learning to delete them as I have them so that I don't get them confused. Um, I invited everybody on joint fiscal to a meeting that didn't exist by mistake. <laughs> the nice thing is they kept saying yes. <laughs> so I had my own little private joint fiscal party. Um, so uh, anything else anyone has? Thank you all. Nice to see you. Okay, I'm gonna end the live stream now.